No one truly knows how many starships have been lost or destroyed during the eons of warfare across the galaxy. In fact, I doubt any single race or empire could count their own losses, such as being the scale of the destruction wrought in the Milky Way, Webway, and Immaterium. Whilst many ships are fully destroyed, many more are left floating in the void or disappear from the material realm altogether. Sometimes, however, a rather strange thing can occur, where many ships, lost or destroyed, will find their way together in a twisted amalgam, floating in and out of real space. They can become havens or breeding grounds for all kinds of factions and races, with wars being fought on them or because of them numerous times. These titanic ships, for lack of a better word, are commonly referred to under the collective name of Space Hulks. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. The exact definition of a Space Hulk is a broad one, due to the wide-ranging variants and their lack of any design. Essentially, a Space Hulk is formed of a conglomerate of other space vessels, typically a blend of destroyed wrecks and ships simply believed lost or missing. Some, if not all, hulks also contain asteroid elements as well, perhaps as a central component or core to the hulk. However, one thing about space hulks is universal. They are titanic in scale, and their amalgamated nature actually makes them very durable, with redundant armour formed from entire ships, no discernible weak points due to not being built, and so on. To give you some context on that last point, a blast from a Nova Cannon, which, as you may recall from a recent log, is essentially a star-launching Ordinatus-class weapon, doesn't cause major damage to a Space Hulk. Destroying one, a common response in any system due to its presence, is incredibly difficult to do, as this should hopefully help you to imagine. How exactly a Space Hulk comes to be, no one is truly sure, as the fusion of ships doesn't seem to be something that would happen naturally. Sure, wrecks could collide with each other and a lost ship may crash into one, but that many times on this grander scale, especially when you start adding asteroids into the mix, I find it hard to believe somehow. Not impossible but I wonder if the warp is involved somehow in the amalgamation process as well, since Geller fields will have undoubtedly failed. Certainly, a Space Hulk is not built in the conventional sense, if only due to their size and their design, or complete lack of it in this instance. In fact, there are many records of Space Hulks so large that they maintain their own usable gravitational field and atmosphere. I'm not going to run the numbers, I don't have the time and no one has the patience, but that means that at least some Hulks are as large as moons or even planets, though I do wonder how their atmosphere is protected from solar radiation without a magnetic field? Maybe it only occurs in Hulks fused with asteroids that contain magnetic metals. No, no, no that wouldn't do it. Hmm, something to ponder. This begs a perhaps not obvious, but certainly interesting question. Can a Space Hulk, especially one with atmospheres and gravity, sustain life on board its twisted amalgamated shell? And the answer is no, because it's not got a source of food or water on board to develop or sustain a population. But that hasn't stopped races and groups from living on them for periods of time. Perhaps the most common example of this can be found with the Orcs. Many Wars travel around on Space Hulks when they launch off from their home planet. In fact, many believe that the gargant-building inspiration of a mech boy or the rise of a war boss seems to coincide with the arrival of a Hulk in the system. There, at least in my opinion, are no coincidence with the Greenskins, pretty much. That's just how their society seems to function. Of course, the Orcs do not usually pilot the Hulk or drive it in any direction, instead just trusting it to take them somewhere inhabited so that they can smash whatever's there when they arrive. Like I say, no coincidences. You see, a Space Hulk doesn't just sit somewhere in real space or in the Immaterium, waiting for more ships to crash into and fuse with it. Instead, Space Hulks travel around pretty much on their own with seemingly no rhyme or reason, including entering and dropping out of the warp pretty much at random after an indeterminate amount of time. Whilst this is fine for the Orcs, since they don't care where they're going and can smash all the demons that invade the Hulk en route, the other infamous Hulk inhabitant probably doesn't care either, actually, but for slightly different reasons. 
Whilst they were first encountered on the moons of Imgal, the Tyranid vanguard organisms known as gene stealers were believed to have spread across the galaxy by infesting space hulks. Most species probably first met them aboard the hulks or following the passing of hulks near to their worlds. The gene stealers are obviously much more insidious inhabitants than the orcs should they take over a space hulk, but due to its scale, it's entirely possible that the two groups could coexist on board without ever encountering one another. If they do, the, of course they will fight, which the orcs are more than happy about to alleviate their own boredom, but the stealthy and agile gene stealers pose a threat to even elite forces such as the Starte's Terminators in the tight corridors and ambush-rich piping of a space hulk. The other faction known to occasionally take up residence aboard a hulk is the forces of Chaos, usually Chaos renegades that may not have a fleet of their own or that need a more stable base of operations. As with the Orcs, they don't control the Space Hulk in any way, and so are hurled in and out of the Immaterium at random, but that seems to work for them just fine most of the time, as it allows for the element of surprise in any invasions, at least as long as they're able to get back on board before the Hulk leaves the system anyway. When a Space Hulk enters a star system that is inhabited, the typical response, at least by the Imperium, is a blend of opportunism and unbridled panic. As discussed already, Space Hulks very often carry dangerous and hostile forces on board, perhaps even several at once, and so any world with a nearby Space Hulk floating around is now a prime target for invasion by Xenos forces or the Armies of Chaos. And as we also mentioned, dealing with a Space Hulk in the sense of blowing it up is exceptionally difficult. It might not take a whole battle fleet, but a few planetary defense guns or a small fleet of Navy ships aren't going to make much of a dent, certainly not before any inhabitants can make it to the fleet or the planet. And yet, for all the danger they pose, many within the Imperium would rather a Space Hulk remain intact regardless of the threat. Most hulks are ancient, containing ships and technology from ages past that would be invaluable to the Adeptus Mechanicus that has lost so much of its knowledge over the millennia. They are a theoretical treasure trove of artefacts, tech and equipment due to their size, age and the variety of their components, and so scouring a hulk to essentially loot it can be incredibly useful. As a result, where possible, Imperial forces will attempt to destroy all inhabitants and opposition on the Space Hulk, taking what relics they can in the process before it disappears into the warp once again. This, whilst lucrative, is not a decision taken lightly, for reasons that should by now be apparent. So a boarding action is only sanctioned when it is convenient, or if the Hulk is deemed to be too close to key worlds to be left alone. Responsibility for these boarding actions is almost always given over to the Adeptus Astartes, no surprise given the danger of such an operation. The risks are so high, in fact, that even convenient raids are usually handled by Terminators of the First Company alone. I'm not sure whether Primaris can be sent in or if only their elite ones go, there's a lack of data on the matter. Mind you, there aren't always Space Marines around, much less Terminators and the like, certainly not enough to guard every system just in case a Space Hulk shows up. And even if there are the requisite forces nearby to attempt a cleansing operation, there's no guarantee that it will be viable or successful in any way due to the resistance on board or a lack of time to prepare. At this point, or the point that it comes too close to key territory, the options for dealing with the Space Hulk become limited to one blow it up. And as I've stressed repeatedly, that's no easy feat by any stretch of the imagination. Essentially, a Space Hulk's arrival is probably the biggest source of panic for certain systems or subsectors outside of an actual full-scale invasion, since it could easily be the herald for one or more of them, and it's nigh indestructible without the right tools on hand. How other races deal with the arrival of a Space Hulk will vary depending on their experiences and their attitude. We already mentioned that the Orcs often use Hulks as a free ride to a good fight, whilst Chaos and Gene Stealer forces can also make the most of them as a home or an opportunity. The Eldari don't particularly hold territory in real space anyway these days, and they have the technology to hide or transport themselves into the webway at their convenience, so the passing of a Space Hulk to them is probably an inconvenience or an annoyance at worst. 
I would wager, however, that many of the Tau Firecast have lost their lives aboard Space Hulks, since the lack of space constricts battlesuit pilots and their ranged advantage is lost due to the twisting layouts rife with ambushes and blind corners. And the Necrons? They probably either don't care or just take amusement in blowing passing Hulks up because they can. Though many stories are short, there have been a fair few Space Hulks or incidents involving them that have become rather infamous. Perhaps the most famous Hulk that is famous due to itself and not its inhabitants would be the Sin of Damnation. Whilst the first sightings and battles involving it have been lost, unsurprisingly, the Blood Angels chapter used it as a means to redeem a past failure. In late M40, the Blood Angels had assaulted a Space Hulk, though not the Sin of Damnation, in the Secoris system, location unknown. Unfortunately, they seemingly committed their entire strength to the Operation rather than just their Terminator Elite, and the Operation went so wrong that the chapter was all but annihilated, with only 50 surviving Astartes. Though the former Ninth Legion was able to rebuild itself, the shame of Sekoris hung over them for centuries. And then the Sin of Damnation appeared in 589M41 in a system nearby to Baal. Eager for redemption and vengeance, 80 elite Terminators were dispatched under the command of a Captain Raphael, who I believe had actually been at Sekoris too, to cleanse the Space Hulk. Aboard the ship, the Blood Angels encountered a massive Gene Stealer infestation. After action reports suggest that some 40,000 Gene Stealers were slain by the Terminators throughout the operation. Whilst this was still likely not enough to wipe the Tyranids out due to the sheer size of the Sin of Damnation, the Blood Angels were rewarded for their efforts with the recovery of a lost chapter relic, further cleansing the wounds from Sikoris upon the Sons of Sanguinius. The world of Armageddon, already a world infamous for never-ending war, has actually been the site of not one, but two Space Hulk appearances. Whilst at least one of the Hulks may have been able to survive what followed, their inhabitants were far less lucky. The first to appear was the Devourer of Stars, a Space Hulk that had been commandeered in the warp by the Titanic Chaos Force led by the demon Primarch Angron. The Red Angel was seeking to unify his World Eaters Legion, bringing together some 50,000 of the former Warhounds that had been shattered by Khan the Betrayer at Scalathrax. Carried by the warp aboard the Devourer of Stars, this vast host of the Blood God's warriors reached Armageddon in 444M41, and unleashed hell upon the world already torn by insidious results and violent uprisings. The Devourer of Stars is believed to have played no part in what became the First War of Armageddon, possibly re-entering the warp even before Imperial reinforcement could arrive in the form of the Space Wolves and Grey Knights, and it has never been recorded as appearing since. Unlike the Devourer, mind you, we know exactly what became of the second Space Hulk to enter the Armageddon system. In around 939M41, a Space Hulk appeared in the Zornian system in Segmentum Solar, a place with a dying star causing intense and lethal radiation to one of its primary planets, the Orc-held world of Urk. Whether the Hulk had arrived by chance or by fate is unclear, no coincidence with Greenskins makes me think the latter, but it proved to be the perfect boon and opportunity for the ruler of Urk to save his war and take it to the stars. That orc was none other than the warlord Gazkul Mag Urugthraka, who christened the Space Hulk as World Killer and brought his armies on board. On its journey through the warp, World Killer was beset by multiple demonic incursions that gave the orcs a break from boredom and good fighting practice, but it eventually spat out War Gazkul in the Armageddon system, and with Armageddon having once been Ulanor, site of one of the greatest orc empires perhaps ever, this was also likely no coincidence. Rather than use rocks, ships, or assault craft to reach the planet's surface, Gazkul took the more direct approach. As far as the records I've seen go, World Killer was smashed directly into Armageddon like a titanic dropship, causing untold devastation to the world. This makes me think that it can't have been that large as Space Hulks go, since a large Hulk could probably crack a small planet on impact, and even a massive world like Armageddon would have been in a lot more trouble than is believed. 
Either way, whether it crashed, was destroyed, or escaped like the devourer of stars, World Killer has not been seen since the Second War for Armageddon. And there you have it, an insight into the Titanic Space Hulks, their operation, and their inhabitants. Suffice it to say that you never really want to be around a Space Hulk if you can help it. Odds are it's crawling with hostiles or is just outright lethal in itself, and taking one out, or even getting on board one, is more effort than sense. And yet, for the toughest of warriors and prospectors, opportunities often await, making the Space Hulks a tantalising prospect if you've got the resources on hand to take or cleanse one. For now, however, we must move on. Next time, something a little different. We're going to up the scale again. We've gone from massive guns to massive spaceships, and now we're going on a trip to a world and a system that was perhaps the epicentre of the Cicatrix Maledictum's birth, formerly one of the most fortified worlds in all of the Imperium of Man. Thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.